we go. There we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Thanks for hanging out with us, sharing this, this hour with us. Hopefully, some of the things we'll discuss in this hour will have lasting effects far beyond just this hour. So it will certainly be worth your time investment, but we don't take it lightly. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. And what we're going to be talking about today uh, is five sales psychology shortcuts to bring you quota in 2020. So talking a lot about mindset, how to set up the brain, your overall well-being for, for success. And we certainly have the right people on this webinar to discuss it. Before I introduce my incredible, incredible panelists, uh, super quick housekeeping as people trickle in. Uh, so we had uh, a ton of you join. I think it was just above, uh, somewhere around 650, um, which is really cool. I see you all trickling in now. Um, but just two things. So number one, these are meant for the community. You know, we do these for, for you guys and gals. So uh, if you have burning questions, things that you're struggling with now, uh, mentally, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, please ask your questions, be, be ultra specific. Um, and we will uh, get to as many as we can. Um, and then it's also much more enjoyable uh, for myself, for the panelists, when we know who we're rocking with. So uh, if you can go down, uh, there is a chat section, introduce your name, your title, what company you're from, um, so we can know who we're, who we're hanging with. And secondly, uh, these are all recorded. So there's a whole slew of new things that can happen in this work from home world we live in. Uh, a dog can, you know, start biting your leg. Your kid can start screaming. Uh, a million and one things. If you have to jump off and deal with something, it's all good. We'll send this to you within 24 hours. Um, but that's it. That's all the boring stuff out of the way. Uh, I now want to introduce my incredible panelists. I am joined by Sanj, Kevin, and Josh. Gentlemen, welcome to the Sales Hacker community. Hell yeah, my man. Let's rock. Thank you. All right. Let's do it. And Katie, I guess I should say welcome back. And why don't you kick off um, with what's the Katie superhero origin story? Who are you? For those who maybe, you know, live under the LinkedIn rock and don't know who this beast of a human is, who's Katie? Um, I don't know that I've reached superhero status yet, so I don't know if I can give the full origin um, story, but um, Kevin Dorsey, everyone calls me KD, VP of Inside Sales at Patient Pop, um, and I think my sales origin story chose to get into sales because I thought it was the most um, secure job I could have, not because there wasn't a lot of turnover, but because I knew I could always find a sales job, even if I sucked. I was like, they're always hiring for sales, so like I can I can find a job. And it's the, one of the best decisions I think I've ever made, um, especially once I started to become a student of the game, like really reading, really studying, really getting into psychology, behavior and all that type of stuff. And so I've been able to, you know, grow to where I am now. Um, I love building teams and, and building teams the right way. You know, taking care of the person and salesperson is something you and I have talked about a lot. So excited to be here, excited to share some of the learnings and also learn from these other two gentlemen on here as well, because mindset and psychology mean a lot to me. And so this should be a good one. So thanks for having me. Love it, man. Always happy to, to host you. And moving on, uh, Sanj, let's hear that the superhero origin story. How did you uh, come to start such a cool company in, in concert finance? Yeah, I'm Sanj Sanapiti, co-founder and CEO of Concert. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Concert is a commission software that's based in um, neuroscience and behavioral psychology. Uh, so we uh, help people create plans that are, are motivating and, and drive performance and also give you real-time reporting that helps you learn better. Um, I came into the sales world. I, I used to be a CFO, womp womp. Um, and, uh, it, uh, always kind of like viewed sales and sales targets as like this kind of bullshitty, like, uh, does this really matter? Like rearranging the deck chairs kind of activity. Um, and, uh, since starting concert and being on the other side, I now like understand those targets, uh, from a different perspective. I'm not the one putting them in a spreadsheet. I'm the one who is held to them. Um, but we've learned a lot as we've created the platform 
And um, I'm excited for this because, you know, so much of what we talk about as a company is like, you know, CROs, how do you set better targets? But if you're inheriting a crappy target, uh, how do you deal with that? And I think it's exciting to share some of that research. Yeah. Can't wait to, to pick that brain of yours. Certainly, you guys are on kind of the, the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff and hopefully will shake up the world that uh, how salespeople are are rewarded, how we hit targets, how we set targets. Uh, so excited to dive into it. And last but definitely not least, uh, Josh, your uh, superhero origin story, please. All right. Hi guys, Josh Leiter. Um, honored to be here, part of this panel. Uh, I, in my current role, um, I'm the senior associate at Graphite Financial. We're an outsourced accounting firm for early stage startups. I manage all the sales, business development, marketing, I'm kind of a one man team there. Um, as we grow, uh, but maybe more relevant to this conversation is I'm the past founder and chief marketing officer at a, a startup called Meditation Works. We were a corporate mm-hmm. meditation company. Uh, we worked with and we developed programs for corporations all across the country. We had a very small but awesome acquisition um, back in September, uh, which ended my Meditation Works career and led me to Graphite. Uh, but I'm kind of the similar position of KD. I'm super intrigued by the psychology behind sales. Um, there's so much that goes into it in terms of how your brain can help you perform better uh, and just help you like enjoy the grind. It's, it's not really worth it unless you're happy and you're doing it uh, and ha- or happy while you're doing it. Um, so that's where, that, where I focus a lot of my efforts. Um, my story in sales uh, is I, I, before Meditation Works, I had another company. I had won a few pitch competitions for that throughout university and after. And in my brain, I was just thinking like, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, you know, I'm good at this you know, startup thing. I wasn't an entrepreneur. I'm just half decent at sales. And I think sales is a role that a lot of people don't realize they're in until they you know, have the title of sales. Um, so yeah, background in meditation, doing sales now. Um, and I love melding the two and helping people understand where they intertwine. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm sure the community can now see kind of the red thread of why we have the, the perfect people to, to wrangle with this, this topic. So excited to dive into it. And I think a great way to kick this off is kind of get a sense of where people are at, right? So it'll, it'll help us kind of better inform this discussion. So I want to do a couple polls. Um, and the first one is going to be a two-part question. So one is for leaders, and it's going to be, do you believe your current sales goals are attainable and realistic? And then the second one will be, do you believe your current sales goals are attainable and realistic if you are a rep? So we'll go ahead and launch that poll. All right, I got to, uh, predictions. Time to put the Nostradamus hat on. Uh, Sanj, what do, you, what do you think from what the market tells you? Do you think that... Uh, sales uh, goals are, are attainable right now? Um, I think most stats that you look at are, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60% of reps are hitting quota. So um, I think most goals are a hot mess. <laughs> Josh, anything to add on top of that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to agree with Sanj. And I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, in the tech startup world today, there's a lot of investment being pumped in that, pushes a lot of requirements on salespeople. It all gets pushed down. Um, and the data shows, you know, it's, it's, there's definitely some error there for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And last but not least, Katie, what do, what do you think of me? I mean, I think it's defining attainable, right? And I think this is actually one of the underlying themes that not a lot of people know or understand in the startup world or anything else. Most financial plans are not built anticipating 100% of reps get to their goals. Mm -hmm. And so the goal, that's where things get tricky, right? I want all 100% of my team getting to goal, but the CFO may not want that, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what's hard. So attainable, if 60% of people are getting to the goal, is the goal attainable? Well, 60% of people are attaining it right? But there's 40% not. So attainable, I think, is a tricky one to look Mm -hmm. at. I just had this conversation with my team is there are people getting there. So it does mean it's attainable, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's 
easy. So that's where I think it gets tricky sometimes, but also not a lot of people understand a lot of these investors are, you know, where you're getting money from, they don't even want a hundred percent to get there. It means the goal is too easy, which is right. what, you know, now you get into this weird game. I've had that conversation before. Too many of your reps are getting there. Wait, what? So, and Sanj can speak to this as a, as a CFO, like those conversations happen. Yeah, it's not like our proudest moment, um, but <laughs> <laughs> once your model gets better, you have that conversation less. But mm -hmm. I think to Katie's point, one more element of attainable is like, is remembering that targets are perceived by people, right? Mm -hmm. So we each have an individual relationship with that goal. So like what is attainable to each of us is actually really shaped by our own experience, our own training, or, you know, our how we perceive our colleagues. So uh, there's a lot more to it. Right, totally. And so we got the results in, all right, so 17% of leaders say our goals are way too unrealistic. We're not gonna reach them. 52% the large majority say our goals are challenging, but we may reach them. 31% uh, say we're on or almost on track and we'll likely reach it. Uh, no one thinks their goals are too easy, not one human. Um, and then from a, a rep level, uh, similar, except less saying that they're on track. So only 17% they're on, they're on track. No one's saying the goals are easy. 67 say it's challenging, might reach them. 17% say it's way too unrealistic. So interesting stuff. Um, and I don't know if it's, that's overly surprising. I think a lot of that would, uh, the guess and then next question i want to do is so in dealing with that world if we think these are super hyper challenging and a lot of us aren't on track i'm curious to know do you actively practice to improve your mindset do you have a some sort of mindset practice that could be meditation that could be journaling positive visualization can even be you know getting a really good you know sweat in uh, whatever makes your brain function, do you practice that? Um, and let's uh, let's hear. Josh, what do you what do you think, man? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's number one. Like everyone should do some sort of mindfulness practice. I think we're all pretty aware that meditation and mindful not meditation itself, mindfulness in general is very very impactful in our lives. I think the tricky piece is people mistake the word practice. And like just doing it once in a while. So like for me, when I started meditation, I was just like doing it when I would get stressed, you know? Meditation as a mindfulness practice, there are many other things you can do, but meditation in general is not something you just like do it when you're stressed. That doesn't really do anything for you other than in the moment it de-stresses you. Meditation is like going to the gym, you know? You do it once a month or twice a month. It's not going to really do anything for you. Just like going to the gym once a month won't. Uh, but if you do it consistently, it doesn't have to be every day. Uh, but like, you know, once or twice a week to start, you see the benefits and that's where like practice comes in. Whatever that thing is for you, meditation, journaling, put it in your calendar, make it consistent and you will see some sort of improvement somewhere, even if it's, if it's minor to the start. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. All right. We've got the results in actually a lot more than I would have thought. 17% say almost never. So they're just like, no, not part of my life. 10% say rarely. So 27% of people uh, rarely or almost never have uh, any sort of mindset practice. Uh, sometimes it's the large majority with 27%. Um, and then often is three to five times per week is 22%. Almost every day, 25%. Nice work. That's awesome. So um, that's interesting there. Uh, Sanj, what are your thoughts on, on those results? I mean, I'm really shocked. So. I I would say like probably in part because I'm a CFO and like really mathy. Um, I was like, but meditation, like whatever hippies, like enjoy <laughs> like your hour. I'm going to go to the bar. Um, but uh, actually, I met Josh at a conference back in February, back when conferences were a thing, and um, we uh, he really like opened my eyes to to like what meditation actually does. Like it shrinks parts of your brain that are, are like really exposed to stress. 
So you're actually more in control in stressful moments. And like kind of what I've noticed since I've started incorporating more of a practice, I'm not like every day, but at least once or twice a week. Um, but I've noticed that when I'm in sales calls, I'm like less quick to jump in with an answer or less quick to respond to an objection. I'm, I'm more able to like control that stress, uh, compulsive reaction. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting about like kind of the, the science of it is, um, your brain sort of operates in two ways. Like one is the fight or flight, like really stressed out mechanism. The other is rest and digest. And that's the part where you're consolidating information, you're building patterns, you're able to see like underlying threats. Um, I think what's really interesting is that most people operate the brain like a, like a seesaw, right? Like if you're, if you're fight or flight, you can't really digest anything. And if you're rest and digest, you can't really respond. Um, but MRI studies of, of monks shows that they're not a seesaw. They just like lift the whole plane up. Mm-hmm. They're doing both things at the same time. And if you like, just like conceptualize how you would approach the world so dramatically differently by doing that. I, I think that's really powerful. Like what is it to be like that salesperson who can like respond with the right amount of urgency, but also really listen to the underlying challenges and match it up to what you've heard before. Like mm-hmm. I, I think that is like a huge, huge skill set that that we can all cultivate and learn from. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's yeah. an incredible way to put that. And yeah, Josh jumped in, man. I was going to say, like, that, that's like what changed it for me with meditation is learning about kind of what Sanj was talking about, the science behind it. There was a study done by Harvard in 2015 that really changed the meditation industry as a whole, um, led by Sarah Lazar. And basically what they found, they did an eight-week program uh, with a bunch of people, and they found that your hippocampus actually increased and like physically changed in your brain It increased in density. And that's the part of the brain that works with cognition and memory, uh, emotional regulation. And then what Sandra's talking about, the, the amygdala, the spider flight mechanism in our brain, that's like, it's a, it's a primal instinct in us that like back in the day when a mountain lion would pop out and attack us, our amygdala would fire, pump our bodies with adrenaline, and we would either fight or we would run. Um, our amygdala fires now when like we get an objection on a call or a baby's crying on an airplane, these times when it's not supposed to be firing because we're so overly stimulated all the time, with technology and things, meditation literally shrinks that part of your brain. So you're Is it me or him? I don't know. I, I can I think Josh froze. I, I think okay. it's Josh. All right. Well, we'll let Josh get back. Oh, there he is. Oh, Josh, you're back. Me. <laughs> so we, we lost you talking about the uh, amygdala and the flight or flight response. You know, a baby starts crying on an airplane uh, right around there. Yeah, just, just generally like it physically changes your brain to be less reactive. It's not like something that you will naturally do these things over time if you practice meditation or another mindfulness practice. And that's what's intriguing to me. It's like you're literally building or shrinking a muscle in your brain to pretty much make you a superhuman in the sales world, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. I love it. It's almost this like ability to pause when you have stimuli in front of you and before you react to it. So you can almost be proactive and reactive at the same right. time and not have to like go away, think about it, decompress. You can, you can do these at once, which is arguably what you need to do to be an effective seller. Uh, Katie, I know you have thoughts here too. I mean, they, they covered it, man. Like the, the science behind meditation is borderline comical. Like (laughs) it's so strong. And I actually did this by the way. Like I, I went to my, my HR team was like, can I make meditation mandatory? Like, can I make it mandatory for my team to meditate if I build it into the workday? Because it's, it's the, the science behind it is so strong. Meditation makes you more creative. You what solve problems better. With? They said no, and, <laughs> which was, and I was like, wait, 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 wait. I was like, wait, 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 wait. So weird, I, can, I can force people to do a soul sucking task like cold call, but I can't force people 
to do meditation. And the reason they gave back is that because meditation sometimes has a spiritual connotation that they didn't feel comfortable forcing that. I was like, oh, but at the same time that we did like we did sessions that were optional and we've done this multiple times as groups is like meditating as a group and meditating like in a room together and doing guided meditations, but dude, like more creative, less stress, faster learning, higher EQ, better listening, better conversation. I mean, better sleep, more energy, better metabolism. I mean, it's stupid. Like it is like, it's, if I have something that strong and that's, if I could give every salesperson one tool, it would be meditation. If every salesperson in this country meditated, we wouldn't see only 50% of them getting to goal. And even if it weren't about goal, we wouldn't see them burning out as much as they do. We wouldn't see them as stressed as they are. We wouldn't see a lot of the addictive um, habits that a lot of salespeople have because they're trying to offset the stress that they're having in the day-to-day, which has them seeking out the high energy, high impulse, high addiction type things. So I mean, I think everyone should do it. I really do. Take that one step further on every person, not just every salesperson. Oh, yeah, for sure. Imagine where we'd we'd be at right now. I love it. All right, let's get to the next poll. This is the last one, and then we're going to dive into uh, some of it here. So uh, meditation, yes, that's one part of it. There's also this idea of, you know, leaderboards used all the time in sales. I remember having one, um, you know, starting my, my career. I think it's pretty table stakes. Curious to hear, uh, does your team use a sales leaderboard to rank performance? And do you think that they're, they're, they're motivating? Because there's a lot of differing opinions and I'm excited to get the, the science behind it from, from Sanj and, and break it down. All right, let's see. We'll give three, two, one. All right, does your sales team Use one to rank performance. 58% said yes. Uh, 42% say no. Do you think sales leaderboards are motivating? Um, One, 53 say yes, I love climbing the ranks. Seven say, I don't even really pay attention to it. 40% say no, it's not at all motivating. Sometimes even demotivating. So that is interesting. So they're they're working for some, they're they're demoting others. So they're, they're not only not working, but they're detracting. So whatever that balance is, I don't know if it's uh, the, the good outweighs the bad. Sand, you have some, some thoughts on this. Let's hear. Yeah, uh, probably like the like most impressive, long-term, well-crafted study on sales performance and incentives uh, was one done by a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And he he tested the efficacy of leaderboards. And I I think I'm really surprised to see that 53% of people find it motivating because what his study found is across all parts of the performance curve, lower performers, core performers, or, or really high performers, even superstars, everyone did better when they didn't have the leaderboard. Um. And his his research was like so well done that like Google's adopted it. Like it's kind of a, a big deal in like the organizational psychology world, and I guess like people who care about leaderboards. Um, but I think it, that kind of tells you a lot about why you know it's again that part of of the sales world where people are are like living on stress right? Like you can't sustainably survive on stress. Um, So like the actual science of it is there are ways that competition can be extremely motivating. A stack rank leaderboard is like not the way. It doesn't meaningfully engage you with your goal. It doesn't meaningfully engage you with the other participants. So it's a way to get some of those benefits is um, find a friendly rival. So, you know, like Scott, say you and I are like, like really neck and neck. Like, let's just try to do better than each other and have like a friendly wager on it. Um, so there, there is like a pretty compelling reason to as, an, as a rep to turn off the leaderboard. Yeah, that's that's fascinating, and I think you know even 
this survey results. And someone has a great question. Why, why do you think there's a disconnect between that study and the way people feel? And it's because we've been told that they're motivating. That's what, mm -hmm. that's what they tell us, right? They're like, oh, why are we having this? I don't want all my results. It's like, no, this is to motivate the team. This is to get people uh, there. So it's kind of, it's, that's the narrative that's been told to us for a long time. And we've got some people, you know, Alan says disagree. Rankings is like playing a sport, which I agree to a certain extent, but the best athletes I've ever known. And when you look at a lot of the best athletes on documentaries and stuff, they're out there competing with themselves. So they're competitive. They want to beat themselves. They're not, they don't get care what buddy on the other team is doing. They're out to smash their personal best. Um, right. And so um, my wife was a gymnast. We followed gymnastics weirdly in my house. Um, and if you guys know Simone Biles, like probably the best gymnast who ever lived, um, she could have showed up to the world championships last year. And just the starting difficulty value of her, her skills, she could have fallen on every discipline and still been world champion. That's how freaking good she is. But instead of resting on that, Simone Biles rolls out two new skills that have never been done. That's what a superstar does. They're not climbing to the top of the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. And they can only be almost be seen as distraction, right? Yeah. Like in that example, the leaderboard, if she had looked and been like, oh, I'm good. I'm already at the top. I, if that was the only thing driving. That's, that's right. I that's love serious. that. Job. It, it, it like for some people it works for sure. And maybe that's just been so that it works. But it is like such a distraction. Anything that you're like for, too forward thinking about isn't like doesn't allow you to perform in the present moment. Uh, one of the better quotes that I, I try to live by, not always to try, is I don't remember who said it, but a, a, a better life starts with a better year, and a better year starts with a better month, and a better month starts with a better week, and a better week starts with a better day. And all you can focus on is that better day to make that better year come. It's the same thing with these leaderboards. It's like you're telling people to like, Focus on that end result, like get to the top of that leaderboard when it should be the reverse conversation. Like, what are you doing today to get to that goal? And again, like that leaderboard, that end goal for a lot of people is, is a distraction, it takes away from the performance they could have. Mm, totally. And we're getting some great uh, questions coming in. And I'm just going to let the, the community drive because they always turn the best when I just do that. So um, here's a good question. This is from Scott. Uh, Segalarta, Scott, great question, man. Uh, Katie, I'm going to hit you with this one. With the increased lack of response to calls and emails, uh, I'm reading through the lines due to COVID, how do you maintain confidence in the process of reaching out to prospects? So open rates and connect rates are, are going down. How do you maintain that in like real time? There's no time to go and meditate after every call. Is there though? Um, so, okay. So, um, can you read it one more time? Just so I get the full question there. So the question is sure. how to maintain confidence in the process or how to stick with it when things are hard. With the increased lack of response to calls and emails, how do you maintain confidence in the process of reaching out to prospects? Got it. Okay. So I am a big believer and I say this to my team all the time is being proud of how you work. Okay. Being proud of how you work, not just the, the end results, the confidence in the process you have to stick with regardless of what those end results are. Right. Because things are harder right now. They are, but this is why I'm such a big believer in personal standards. Are you being your best self? Forget the process for a second. Forget the end result for a second. Are you working in a way that you are proud of? There are going to be challenges in life. There are going to be times where the thing that used to work doesn't work anymore. But the problem is when most people get into that situation, they stop working. Oh, what I was doing before doesn't work anymore. So now I'm going to stop working right so there are two different things there's confidence in the process there's your own personal standards of like i'm going to be my best self did i do my best kd today and if you're doing those things and also why we're talking about meditation if you're taking care of yourself 
you might start to have better ideas too. Mm -hmm. You might start to find different ways to approach that process. You might come up with a new idea and be more creative. It's when you like come in on yourself and start beating yourself up because the end result isn't there. That's when you get in trouble. So every day doing your best, whether the result was there or not, is the first step. And then taking care of yourself through that process. But if you attach your own personal wealth to the end result, that's, that's when it all goes downhill really fast. Right. So that would be my advice there. Yeah. I I can't agree with Katie more on that. I think so many of us are taught to like think in the process of like, you know, I need to close this deal to get to that goal. And like, there's this stress involved in that. There's a stressor that's, that's motivating you there compared to thinking of it the flip way, which is I'm genuinely trying to help this person and get behind what we're doing here, which will in, in turn, if I do this, help my sales goal. It's like, if you, if you think of it this way, like I need to make 50, you know, I, I need to close 50 deals this month. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to grind really hard and make a ton of phone calls. And that's going to help us accomplish our mission. And, you know, to use graphite as an example, like accomplish our mission of helping founders uh, who are like miserable dealing with their books, you can flip that on your head and have a mindset of there are so many founders out there that are miserable and stressed managing their books. They're miserable. They hate it. I'm going to contact as many of them as possible this month. And at the end, I'm going to, my plan is to help 50 of them. It's such a different mindset and it's so much more motivating in the moment. So like what Katie is saying, like think about it from a point of stress compared to thinking about it from a point of like compassion or excitement. Um, and that itself can help you just be happy with the process and to stick with it and to stick with what you're doing. Yeah, we um, so like kind of tactically for comp plans, we uh, advised one of our customers to start paying on demos, win or lose. I think one thing that people often lose sight of is you should be losing most of your calls. That's mm-hmm. kind of how this works. You're not the right solution for everyone. If you're not losing, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, so like pay, find places where you can incent people win or lose. Um, and for this one customer, like it turns out that it actually built some resilience to their team. So they set up Q1 really well. They got through Q2 despite COVID in a pretty uh, strong position. They probably three quarters of their original target, which is pretty good in this market. Um, You know, that one of the kind of tactics, like one of the hacks that we're talking about to really address this problem is like shorten the time frame that you're measuring yourself against. Like, so someone gave you a quarterly goal, like the person who gave you a quarterly goal literally does not know what the world would look like three months from now. I don't think anyone does. Um, So shorten to a weekly goal or monthly goal. Um, what happens when you shorten your time frame of when you're measuring yourself is you end up translating kind of obscure goals into specific tactics. Um, so uh, uh, the example that's used when people are explaining psychological distance is like, if I talk to you about like, Katie, tell me about a vacation you want to take next year. It'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, I want some sun. I want to be able to read this book. I want to listen to these podcasts. Great. Um, When I ask you two weeks before, you might know where you're going, what book you're taking, what podcast you have downloaded. You actually start moving towards the tactics. So if you are concerned that your process isn't working anymore, then, then shorten those goals. Start observing more closely what's happening week to week, and you'll have a little more confidence in, in making any tweaks. Real quick on that, Scott. I just want to wrap on that real quick. One of the things that um, we do with with, with my team and I also do in my personal life is we call it three by three. What are the three things daily, three things weekly, and three things monthly you're committed to doing to bring you closer to your goal, right? And three things, that's it. What are the three things daily that if you checked those three things off, you have a better chance to hit your goal? What are the three things weekly that if you checked off, you have a better chance of hitting your goal in the three things monthly, right? So we're narrowing it down even further from a month to a day where Mm -hmm. everything went wrong, but three things that you were in control over, you did. And for some of my reps, we reset this in um, 
in April when everything hit the fan, some of those daily three by threes were get dressed for the day. And that was okay. It wasn't hit a hundred dials. It was get out of bed, get dressed, do my hair. And like, and that was something that they felt if they did every day would give them a better place to go, right? A better chance. So three by three, three things daily, weekly and monthly, but these are non-negotiable. You do these things no matter what, and you'll be shocked at what you can achieve. I love it. What's that uh, Warren Buffett quote that is very much in line with that? It's like, write down 25 things you want to accomplish in life, circle the top three and scratch the rest out. Because, um, right. you know, focus is, is a huge part of it. And, you know, touching on a few things there, synthesizing a few things, I think, sounds your point on kind of incenting, incentivizing the behavior you want over the result is so incredibly key. Um, and, you know, I think for me, and I've done a lot of, you know, self-work in this area from, you know, living in the Amazon to like float tanks to like, you name it, I've tried to figure this out. And like, for me personally, which I think of as a lot of people is like, happiness and confidence just comes from you telling yourself, I'm going to do something and then you do it. So it's exactly what KD said, like, just say, I'm going to do this. And then you, you make that happen. And then it allows you to tackle the bigger things and the bigger things. You know, it reminds me of the, the power of habit, the Charles Duhigg uh, book that's incredible, kind of in this vein. Um, all right, let's keep it rolling, though. We got a lot of great questions. Um, okay. Where was that good one? All right, let's do, we'll do this one. This is always one that comes up. Could you recommend a couple of books and podcasts that touch on neuroscience behind sales and success, behavioral economics? Who's got the books? Katie, that looks like there's 40 behind you. Jesus. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess, obviously, a classic on this is Drive by Daniel Pink. That's always a good one to start with in terms of behavior and motivation. Um, Behave is another really good one along those lines. Atomic Habits is another good one that talks about like how behaviors are actually built and like what actually motivates people. Another good book is um, Why Motivating People Doesn't Work. Um, I wish I could remember <laughs> the, um, the author for that one, but that's a, a good one as well. But really, you know, it's paying attention to like how people actually behave and think. And that's where... I think people get off all the time. Sanj and I have talked about this. Almost every study that's done on motivation, actually, I think this is something that would be either a good poll or a question we're going to have here in terms of what motivation actually means. Because I think people get that confused. What does it mean to motivate somebody? Mm -hmm. But almost every study that's been done on motivation, on what works best, sales goes against. Right? Like putting money tied to a cognitive task decreases performance. They've studied this, right? The more you pay for like putting bolts on a tire, okay, performance goes up to a certain point. But once it's problem solving and you tie money to it, creativity goes down. Autonomy, not that much of that in sales, comes down, right? Like it's, it's an interesting thing that we go against so many things that have been shown to improve performance. But someone asked this question earlier, right? They said, well, no, 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 no. It definitely motivates me leaderboards do motivate me the study that Sanj was quoting did not say motivation it said performance mm -hmm. it said performance went up without the leaderboard people get motivation and performance very tight actually here's a yes here we go one of my favorite books performing under pressure right really good book is that by? this is by Jesus, Andre Weisinger and J.P. Paula. Damn, I don't know, dude. I can't. <laughs> Good, <man. laughs> All right, people, people look this up. I can't say it right now. Um, but it, it got me. It got me. It was actually very funny. Like, of course, I got this when I first became a VP of sales. I'm like, oh god, <laughs> like this is a whole nother level of pressure. And I was like, how do I perform better under pressure? And one of the first things it talks about is no one performs better under pressure people just perform less worse than others. So every person that you think is clutch, no one actually performs better 
under pressure. They just perform less worse, right? And so that really changed my, my mindset on this is like, oh, right? If you want people to be better, better performance, to Sanjay's point, it's actually about the removal of pressure. The only place that pressure does anything is getting things done. A deadline helps you get done, but the performance is actually better without the pressure. So I think that's some people get it confused, like motivation. You might be more motivated under pressure. It doesn't mean your performance is better. Well, I, I think Katie's like touching upon the difference between like the pressure and the stress that people try to create um, versus like a good target actually gives you focus. Those are, you're not like stressing someone out to perform. You are focusing someone on what the really important activities are. Um, it, so like book recommendations. So like when I'm probably bad at this as everyone at a concert knows, like I just read like boring academic studies all the time. Um, but, uh, the, the book that like really spoke to me is called Irresistible by Adam Alter. It's actually a book about technology addiction, um, but it talks a lot about how the brain is so like malleable, like how you it, how easy it is to focus someone. And um, we talk all the time about marathons. So when you look at marathon performance times, they actually uh, are are multimodal. So they cluster around um, key finish time. So like, you know, whatever the pace setter is running with, whether it's three hours, uh, 3.30, four hours, whatnot. So the most common marathon finish time is three hours and 59 minutes. It's because there is someone out there running with four hour sign. And if you're reasonably close to it, you're like, yeah, I'm going to give it a little more. Um, like this last mile, I can probably pick up the pace and beat that person. Um, the difference between three hours and 59 minutes and four hours and one minute, there's a 40% drop off in performance. It's because the target no longer becomes relevant because you're no longer focused on that thing. Um, so uh, it's super interesting. It's also like probably good for this environment when we're like all on zoom and our phones all the time and it's hard to disconnect from work like it it really helps you understand like how evil some tech companies might be <laughs> absolutely and quickly Sanjay, a, a question for you recommendations of where to go to access uh those studies um that the, these papers and things on uh, how why people behave the way they do where do you get that information um, from so we've worked with uh, neuroscientists and behavioral psychologists who sort of point us in the direction of a lot of them. Yeah. Um, uh, you, for a more accessible route, you can come to our blog post. We link to kind of the research behind everything. Um, and we'll be sending out a few of these studies uh, that kind of touch upon the points we were discussing um, as a follow-up to this. I love it. Josh, any uh, books quickly before we, we move on? Yeah, just one that comes to mind. Uh, you know, Katie and Tom Stark touched on a lot of good stuff. The one that I that really helped me, and it's leaned more towards meditation, my, my deal, uh, but it's 10% Happier uh, by Dan Harris. Uh, it's a lot about his story with meditation and how he came to be, you know, an advocate of it. But it talks a lot about the act of mindfulness in general. And like San said, we are so bombarded by technology and stressors these days. It's impossible to be immune to the things that we're put in front of today. And if you take some time to, it's basically the book says, like if you take time to fix that and like put practice towards that, your brain changes in a way that changes behavior. And it talks about the different behaviors that change and that change with Dan, the studies that have been done. It's a good high level book to like introduce yourself to like, uh, brain behavior and how it affects the working world. Um, super easy to read, super quick book, but really, really interesting. I love it. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll quickly pile on two more. One, uh, Why Buddhism is True by Robert Wright is really yes. good. It's not a religious book. It's more of a philosophy, um, psychology book. Super good one. Uh, and then I'm a big Robert Greene guy. So The Laws of uh, Human Nature is, is pretty fascinating mm -hmm. to learn about the brain and, and what's going on 
Um, all right, there was this really good one. I'm trying to, uh, Emily not. Okay, Emily, you've got great questions. Keep them coming. Um, so this goes back to when we're talking about individual leaderboards and we, we talked about this idea that just having a stack ranked doesn't work. So Emily's question is, how can management effectively leverage self-competition? So if we, we throw out the leaderboard, how can we start to layer in processes, things that encourage self-competition? Um, who wants to kick this one off? I'll, I'll rock on this real quick because it's something we're actively working on right now. We actually were working on it before this whole um, pandemic hit because we're going to do it differently. It's giving people their own benchmarks of what was their best. And not just their best in terms of what was your highest month of revenue. Because again, that's just looking at the end result, right? What I want and what we're working on is giving people their historical performance. What's your historical close rate? What's your, what's your historical average dialer, connect rate or conversion rate? Like some of the skill set things and showing them here's what you've achieved before. So this is who you are. You are a 32% closer. You've shown yourself you can do this. How can we beat that? Right. So what we were actually working to do is we were going to put it on a wall, right? Like I wanted it on like the wall, right? So people can kind of see like, you know, almost like their own stock ticker, right? Of like what's been like their skill-based performance, but it was like for them, like, can I beat what I did? Most of your reps, if you ask them what they did four months ago, probably don't remember. Maybe they remember the revenue, but do they remember their skill-based metrics? Do they remember what their close rate was four months ago? Do they know their highest ever close rate? Do they know their highest ever connect rate? Do they know what month they had the most activity ever? No one remembers that because managers don't talk behaviors. They only talk end results. So I want a historical dashboard of showing people. I just had this conversation with a rep last week, really doubting themselves, right? Maybe I can't do this. Maybe I'm not cut out for sales. It's like, so you know you have the skill to be a 37% closer, right? Like you're the same person now as you were then, right? You aren't different right now, but if you start to tell yourself that you are, you're in trouble. You have these skills. Now, are you doing the same things now that you were doing then to achieve those results? So I think giving reps their own historical benchmarks of skill and performance that they can measure themselves against because it's, Sandra said that the results aren't always going to be there. You can give the perfect demo and you might go 0 for 10, but then all of a sudden go four for five, right? It's, it's looking at like, are the behaviors in place that allow you to be successful and not just tying it to that end result, which I know is so hard for both sales leaders and sales um, people on this. I know that's hard, but you have to look at, am I doing the right things? Mm -hmm. to lead to the results and helping reps stay on track with that. Love that. It's the old yeah. Peter Drucker. What, what gets measured gets managed, right? And you need to show the reps at how they can measure themselves and then manage them. Manage themselves. Right. So actually, real quick, I want to jump on that one because there's a follow-up quote from Jason Jordan in the sales acceleration, or not sales acceleration, um, cracking the sales management code. He says, yeah. what gets measured is made aware. It doesn't mean it's managed. And that's actually where a lot of managers go wrong is they believe awareness equals management. Look, you're at the bottom of the leaderboard. Awareness, go fix it. And they think that's management, right? Mm -hmm. Measurement is the first step, but measurement is only awareness. Management is the coaching and the changing and development of behaviors and processes to then change that measurement. A lot of managers lean on measurement as management. You're below goal, go get above goal. And that's where it stops, right? So you do need to measure it, but management and measurement are actually two different things. Totally, yeah. Got to coach against the findings for sure. Josh, you had some, uh, some thoughts there. Yeah, just to touch on that a little bit, some, a, ta uh, a tactic I've used to do exactly what Katie is saying that's worked really well, and a lot of you guys have probably heard about it because most of you are in sales, uh, is OKRs, objectives, and key results. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's one thing to say, like, I'm going to be at the top of lead the leaderboard this month, or I'm going to close 50 deals this month. That's a fine goal, 
but then defining those key results. Like, okay, to do that, I'm going to make X calls per day. I'm going to do this per week. I'm going to do this. You know, this is one thing I'm going to do. This is another thing I'm going to do. All measurable things. And from a leadership perspective, you should be working with your team to define those key results for each of their goals. It shouldn't be like what Katie said, like, uh, you know, be at the top. You're here. I want you to be here. That's silly. That's going to get no one anywhere. That doesn't do anything. Say you're here. I want you to be here. And here are all the things we're going to do in between to make that happen. As a leader, like in my opinion, that's your job. It's not necessarily the job of your sales rep to figure that out themselves. You should be working as a team collectively to figure out what are those measurable things to get you from point A to point B. And if you can do that, it's much more likely that you're going to see performance increases compared to just leaving it to someone to say, well, shit, how do I get to point B? I have no idea. I'm just going to try my hardest. I'm going to put in as many hours as I can. That's just proven to not bring results. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend looking up OKRs. It's a really interesting topic in general, but just a good, easy tactic to define those things. Yeah, I'd add kind of related to what Josh and Katie said, like kind of the the big picture part of this is is whatever you're giving to your team is feedback. So if you want this reporting to be effective in any way, it has to follow kind of the hallmarks of great feedback. So feedback isn't useful. Like the the time value of feedback deteriorates significantly. So it needs to be almost real time. The uh, other part of feedback that's really important is that it's not emotional. So these aren't conversations. If you're a manager, these aren't conversations that you should be having with your team. I, I shouldn't say like, oh, Scott, you are like 20% away from quota. I should be talking to you about the tactics of how to close that 20%. You already know you're 20% away. So it, it's find that target, make it relevant, contextualize it, have a system generate that, make sure it's real time, and that feedback is actually going to be used. You will pick it up. You will do better. Um, it's a little tough. This is probably the one where you're going to need your team to make investments on your behalf. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if you can build kind of an offline side way to do this, then it's worth it. It, it really will show up in your results. Great. Great points. There's also, uh, I recently read this interesting uh, blog post on the power of hyper-specific positive feedback too. So when you're when you're giving someone a compliment, don't just say, hey, you nailed that deal, good job. Say, hey, I loved your ability to, you know, really articulate our value to each level of the C-suite. I, I haven't seen anyone on our team do it that well. And then when you tell people that, it's kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy where they then double down on that skill and get even better at it. Um, which I find it, um, super interesting. It fires up your reward-based learning neural pathways, right? Like, mm -hmm. so having a target focuses you on doing an activity. You perform to the best of your ability what you are supposed to do. And then the feedback is measuring where you're at. And that's how you learn. If you are closer to your target, you're going to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. So if you get positive feedback, you keep doing that. And that, again, touches on, like, setting these process-based goals, not just outcome-based goals that, that KD was talking about, that Josh were ta was talking about. Like, you might be doing all the right things and it's just not resulting in the outcome. You are going in the right direction. So all that negative feedback that you might be getting from customers, like the more you can remind yourself you're not supposed to win all the time, the more you can transform that to positive feedback and learn what you can from that. Yeah, I love it. All right, we are at the five minute mark, five minutes left. So let's do, we have more great questions. Again, thank you everyone for being so engaged this whole time. We're going to just do rapid fire. So I'll just hit you each with one and we'll keep the answers succinct and we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, first one is from Alan. Uh, Josh, I'm going to start with you. Um, he's saying, you, do you guys use any biohacks? Do you use any biohacks, Josh? Meditation, I would consider a biohack. Um, Anything else you're doing to keep the, the mindset and brain uh, working? Yeah, yeah. Look, this one's a, a, a tough question to answer because everyone's different. My personal opinion, and take this with a grain of salt, this is my life. I think a lot of the stuff out there uh, talking about biohacks and all these things you can do, 
is a lot of garbage. There's not a lot of data to back it up. You know, not to call anyone out with products like this, but it's it's it all comes back to the mindset. How does your brain function under stress, under pressure? How does your brain function on a daily basis to help you do better? And the only way to to like at least from the science today to affect your brain and physically change it is some sort of mindfulness, some sort of like practice habit with your brain. Um, meditation is the easiest biohack because it's really, really straightforward. There's so many resources out there. I saw someone asked about like what apps to use. I can definitely touch on that in a second. Um, but it's just the easiest way to like physically change your brain, you know, bio biologically change you to perform better, to be happier. Um, I just, my, my uh, advice there is just be wary of things like make sure there's science to back it up. Even with meditation, I was very skeptical for a long time until these studies popped up. You know, like make sure you understand what you're what you're doing to your body, you're putting in your body um, before you like double down on it. You know, but meditation definitely works. I will say that from from experience. I think Katie and, and Sanj can can relate to that too. So, I love it. Thank you for sharing, man. All right, yeah. Moving on, let's do uh, Sanj. This is a philosophical question almost uh emily's full of right really really good ones um <laughs> how how would you define more productive behaviors what are some examples um i think more productive behaviors i would define as like things that are positioning you for success not actually success in and of themselves so like more productive behaviors are like like finding messages that people are engaging with like without a call to action right like without without booking a demo like you know whatever that's not a special message the special message is the thing um and katie taught me this is is the thing that gets people to engage with your brand first um so find more of those moments like find these things that you can't directly quantify but they're really meaningful totally i love that it's like those high impact activities again it kind of goes back to what we're saying of Write the list of 25, circle the top three that you, you know will have the biggest impact. I think those are the... the yeah, one, one way we um, change probability in Salesforce is uh, did the prospect learn something? Like we, we kind of internally discuss, like, did that person learn something from the call? Did we change the way they think about this? And, and that is like hard to directly measure, but really impactful. All right, one last question, KD. It's coming your way. Sometimes I get so lost in the day to day that I lose sight of why I'm working so hard to begin with. How do you keep yourself grounded in your why? So, one, back to the theme meditation does an amazing job of allowing you to be more present, to separate things out, and just like to take that breath. But I'm actually, hold on, I think I can do this. Um, so, right over there are my goals my three by threes, my um, vision board, like it's there as a reminder. I see it. Anytime I look left, it's right there, right? On why I'm doing what I'm doing. But I've also written out why I'm doing what I'm doing, right? Why is it worth it? Why am I willing to go through the struggle? This was something I learned that changed how I did goal setting and visualization, right? A lot of people teach visualization to just visualize the end result. Oh, I'm on the beach with a six pack and a pina colada with $7 million in the bank. And you, know, you just picture the end result. They've actually found that to be demotivating in terms of changing behavior. You actually do need to visualize going through the process, going through the struggle a little bit. What does getting there look like, right? So I have that all written out in terms of why am I doing this, right? But then every morning, that's what I look at. When I'm journaling, I write it out, right? So the more you can ingrain it into your day-to-day, -day, the better. But when I get a break, the first thing I'm doing is just taking a deep breath. And I'd encourage everyone as we end this, take a deep breath for just 10 seconds here. Breathe it in, hold it, and let it go. And think about your why, right? Breathe it in, let it go. Why am I doing this? This is why. Then go to your next meeting. Be 10 seconds late. That's the only reason I'm ever late is because I'm just doing <laughs> breath work. That's the only reason I'm ever late. But um, that would be my advice there. 
One, write it out. Two, make it visual. Three, build it into your day-to-day. But the fourth, take a breath and bring yourself back there. I love it, man. I now have my next excuse for when I'm when I'm late. So thank you. I was just that. doing breath work. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So quickly to reiterate uh, the five brain hacks. So one, seek real-time feedback. You can learn 2x better about patterns of achieving success. Manage temporal distance. Set shorter time frame targets. Break it into bite-sized chunks. Manage experiential distance. Setting goal for yourself that's better than your previous self. Um, getting competitive but competitive with yourself. Turn off that leaderboard. Stop comparing yourself to others. And then, of course, we really hammered this one home. Meditation and goal visualization. So unbelievably huge. Um, All right, Josh, Sanj, Kevin, thank you so much. That was such a fun session. It really, really was. I appreciate all your insight. And thank you, everyone, for the incredible engagement, as always. Appreciate you all. And have a, a fantastic weekend. Oh, almost at the weekend. Yeah. Almost there. Almost, almost there. Love y'all. All right. See ya.